I'm with you about uh, once a month here at uh, Linwood. The other time I'm at Shoreline. So I'm going to ask you to do something for me that seems a little weird to you, maybe. Um, if you are a member on the roll here at Linwood, you are a member, you've been voted in either by baptism, profession of faith, or you've been on the roll, came in with the inception of the church about five years ago here in terms of in the Washington Conference. If you are a member, if you would just stand for me, I want to recognize you, I want to see. If you are a member here at Linwood, you are a member. Okay. So all members are standing. So members, if you look around there while you're standing. Good, thank you very much. So then lets me know that the uh, rest of you are with us for the first time or second time, or uh, you're considering being a member here at Linwood. Yeah. I didn't hear any amen. 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 That, that's kind of scary. <laughs> so you might be visiting for the first time, you're returning back because you like what you've experienced, and you plan to be a member here at Linwood very soon. No amen. Well, uh, we'll keep praying for that. All right, we want to talk a little bit this morning about uh, obedience. Why the subject of obedience? I was studying uh, some time ago and following the um, revival and reformation with the General Conference and, and studying through the scriptures. And right now we're in the book of Joshua. But a little while back we passed through um, Numbers and then uh, Deuteronomy. And coming through Deuteronomy 11, and then Deuteronomy 28, and these are two of the verses I want to share with you in chapters today. So uh, some thoughts came to me as I looked at this whole notion of obedience. And you may or may not know, and, and I'm seeing now that I'm supposing that many of you that did not stand, that uh, although you are not members here at Linwood, that you are members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I'm assuming. And so, um, Maybe I should ask that question too. I'm still trying to, I'm trying to familiarize myself with you. So if you are not a member of a Seventh-day Adventist church somewhere, uh, if you just raise your hand, if you are not a member of a Seventh-day Adventist church somewhere, if you'll raise your hand, let me see. Okay. Okay. Well, that's about eight of us here. Okay. Think about it. All right. So we've been, we've been in this spirit here, right? Now, the reason I ask that because typically in the Adventist church, we focus a lot on what we sang about today, uh, obedience. <laughs> are you, are you, are, if you're in the Adventist circle, you know we talk about obedience. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not just talking the talk, but you know, you're talking, you're walking. You know, obedience makes a difference. And sometimes we can get in the mode of obedience, and we can be obedient, obedient for the wrong reason. And sometimes we can be obedient halfway and think that we are all the way obedient, and think that we deserve the rewards of obedience, although we've only half done the job, what was expected of us. We've come, I, I term that as complacent. We become place we, we begin to do a little bit and we think, you know, well, it's the whole, you know, we, we're satisfied with the whole thing and we have become self-deceived. And so that's what I want to talk about a little bit this morning. Exciting that is, and because uh, when you come through Deuteronomy, that's one of the chapters I want you to study. And, and I'm going to be very didactic, teaching oriented, and giving you homework and things that you all study as well. Uh, you know, the Bible says that the Bereans, when they came to church on Sabbath, the Bereans, the scripture says, they went home and studied those things to see that they were so. Hello? And my objective, my hope is that you will be even as the Bereans. Not just take what the preacher says, but you will study it and let the Holy Spirit work with you for greater understanding so that you are then able to inculcate what we are presenting. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so uh, our, our first text then is going to be in Deuteronomy 28. In Deuteronomy 28, there you find 
that we're talking about the blessings and the curses. Moses is doing his farewell speech. Moses, who will not be able to make it into the promised land because he has failed to be obedient in one area. The Lord told him to do one thing, he did something else. I'll let you study that for yourself and find out what that was if you don't know. And so Moses now, God is saying, you're not going over this Jordan, but Joshua would be the one that would take them over. And so I need you to just say farewell, goodbye, and climb the mountain, and you're done. Your job is over with. So Moses now, in his farewell speech to the children of Israel, he's telling them about the blessings and the curses. And I'm, I'm thankful that he uses both the blessings and the curses. You know, if you were to die, uh, you were, uh, I stopped some lesson this morning downstairs, we were talking about uh, preparing for change. And one of the changes that will come inevitably, uh, as, uh, as my brother uh, pointed out in the Sabbath school, uh, that the, uh, uh, the, the mortality rate is 100%. We're we all are going to pass at some point. And so when you start to leave and you want to leave behind a legacy, what will you share with your children? Will you tell them uh, about all the good things that you anticipate to be on the other side that you hope to enjoy by and by with the Lord? I mean, even though you haven't been across yet, I mean, what are you going to tell them? Or will you spend time telling them about the repercussions of not obeying? If you don't obey, this is what's going to happen. And you want to admonish them. Be obedient. Do these things. And then things will work out. You know, be faithful. You want to encourage and, and, and also give some excitement about what the possibility of the reward will be. And if they don't obey, what the consequences will be. This was Moses. He was telling about the blessings and the cursing, curses uh, that Israel would have, depending on how obedient they were. And so when you read these, these, this chapter, you see clearly a delineation of blessings and curses. Now we'll go back to chapter 11 of Deuteronomy. And so you, you read all 28 at your leisure. And then chapter 11 is where I want to start. And I think I want to begin around verse 8. And we want to read a few things here uh, this morning. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 11. And let us begin at verse 8. And I'm going to be reading from the... Whether ye go to possess the land of hills and valleys that drink the water uh, of the rain of heaven. Now, you would know if you're in Palestine that you, you rely on water. It's a very arid area. And if you plant seed, you need water. And so already in this, these few verses we've looked at, we see that God is promising or offering rewards or blessings to those who obey him. What are some of the first blessings we already see that come to those who are obedient? Strong. Okay, very good. That you will be strong. The Lord promised strength to those who are obedient. What else, what other promise we see here already in this text? What was that? Long life. Isn't that wonderful? And that's another passage that says, you, uh, 
uh, honor your, your, your parents. If you do that, you know, your, your days will be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. So there's promises. With obedience, there are various promises. Any other promises we see here also? Interest into the land. Interest into the land. And also, good health, rain. I mean, they needed the rain. They needed water. And so today, we don't need water as much in that capacity in terms that we don't have all these great irrigation systems. So it's figuratively speaking, the God raining down the Holy Spirit upon us. So yes, we are obedient. He gives us what? The Holy Spirit. Right? He pours out the Holy Spirit. This is the rain, the early and the latter rain. This is what seals us and ultimately prepares us to cross over. Are you with me? So they, they're getting ready to go across now. So uh, these are the blessings that come to those that obey. Look at what it says. This is not as the Egyptians. You go down uh, verse uh, 12. A land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it. From the beginning of the, of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently unto the Lord... Uh, Diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day. <clears throat> What's the next phrase there? Are you looking at it with me? I'm going to pause for a moment because I'm going somewhere. I want you to get this. To love. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I said, I used the word there. Uh, let's see, it's old King James, but it's still, it's still good. Which I command you this day. Mm -hmm. you, you're telling me? That the Lord is commanding you to love him? <laughs> wait, wait a minute. Are you with me now? Let's take a little bit slower. I want to make sure we get it. Do you command your children to love you? Do you command your spouse to love you? Is it, is it even appropriate to command them to love you? Hmm? But think about it for a moment, you know, with your children. If they don't love you, what, what would you do? The little man said, you get a timeout. <laughs> yeah, if they don't love you, you know, because if they don't respect you, which is to love you, they, if they love you, they respect you, your children. Am I right, parents? And when they don't respect you, they say things they ought not do, things they ought not do, then you punish them. You command, you expect that they love you. Does it seem strange here in the text? That God commands them to, to obey. He commands them to love him. To love the Lord your God. And to serve him. With all of your heart. With all of your soul. This is what he commands. Then he talks about giving the rain. It is symbolic again. Of the Holy Spirit that he wants to pour out into our lives. But he expects for us to love him. He expects for us to obey him. And he commands it. Do you feel comfortable with that? That God commanded you? I uh, mean, using that phrase that God commands us to love. There's a passage of scripture. You all stay with me for a little bit. Uh, John 14, 15. You probably know about memory. That's what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. So he, he's commanding love and obedience. So he commands obedience and then he offers us rewards if we are obedient. Certain things will happen because of our obedience. As well as certain things will happen if we are not obedient. There will also be consequences for not obeying. Now, God wants us to obey, nevertheless, for the right reasons. Can we obey for the wrong reasons? Yes. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so let's slow down for a moment and I'm going to try to follow my notes. And that kind of sets the stage now we're looking at. Remember what we're talking about obedience, obeying for the wrong reasons. Uh, like, is, is it wrong to obey to get the reward? <laughs> if I only do it just because of, uh, let me just put it in context. I'm only good because I, I, I can get to heaven. 
I'm going to come to church. I want to get baptized so I can go to heaven. I want to get baptized so I can go to heaven. I want to live forever. I don't eat that chewy vegan food because I want to live forever. I want to live a long time. <laughs> See, we obey. Follow me. We're obedient. But for the wrong reasons. Is that obedience acceptable? No. Obeying for the wrong reasons. Yes, madam. It's the motive in us. The motive in us, okay? Yes. Yeah, that's good. I want you to keep on holding on to that. We want to write down that, that track. Because oftentimes we find ourselves, we can be very legalistic. We can be very self-righteous. The Pharisees were. We're doing all the right things. Mm -hmm. And yet we will miss the kingdom by a mile. And whether you miss it by a mile or an inch, you still miss it. Yes. Hello? And so, I'm, I, I'm bringing focus to this so that we can look at ourselves and our relationship with God because God demands that we love Him. And if we love Him, then we will naturally obey Him. Hence, we want to obey for the right reasons and not for the reward. One him write up in the words, if heaven were never promised to me, neither a land where we would grow old, it's been worth just having the Lord in my life. Amen. <laughs> just living. Is that, that okay with you? It, it, even if you don't make it to the kingdom, it's been worth just having the Lord in your life. Mm. If heaven were never promised to you, would you still be glad today to be a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, to love the Lord and to serve Him with all of your might? And we say, well, I might as well go out to the club. I might as well build me a Starbucks and see if I can make some of this money like everybody else. <laughs> you know, so would you just give it all up? Or has it really been worth it, living a Christian life connected with the Lord? Yes. Loving him for the right reasons is what he is seeking for us. Yes. So Moses there, as he's talking to the children of Israel, he tells them about the blessings and the curses. He, let me read my notes. Moses wishes to bring all possible motive to bear upon the people to secure their obedience in Canaan. Because he knows God has told them when they go over, they're going to mess up. They're going to do wrong. And Moses is warning them. He's telling them. He's encouraging them. Don't mess up. But he knows they will. He has just been speaking to them about their natural development from a family of about 70 as they went down into Egypt. Now they are as plentiful as the stars of heaven. And he's saying, God did not choose you because you were a great number or because you were doing the right things. He chose you when you were small and you were nobody. He just loves you because of who you are, period. And out of that love, if you would then uh, respond to that love, uh, what, term, what, what, what was the term I'm looking for? Uh, reciprocity. God gives you this <coughs> beautiful love and then you naturally respond to what God has done for you. And then he says that uh, that's basically called out of gratitude. We love God. We serve him out of gratitude. Pause for a moment. Like, why did you come to church this morning? Why did you come here today? Now, most people, most times say, well, I came to get a blessing. You see, you came for a blessing. Well, I hope you came for a different reason. See, it's called worship. <laughs> That's because you've already gotten the blessing. Amen. And you come with a heart filled with joy and gratitude. And now you come to worship. You're prepared to be in this presence, not coming to get a blessing. I mean, suppose your children always come and they're ready to eat. 
parents, those of you who have gotten older now, and the kids that come and visit, and every time they come, they're raiding the refrigerator, taking bags home with them, you know. They're always coming for a blessing. <laughs> any, 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 any of you having adult children? <laughs> well, when they come, Mom, what you got to do? You got a new bed spray, some, I need some additional sheets, I need some different, <coughs> additional towels. You know, they're coming to get the mess. <laughs> I mean, you love your children, yes. But you want them to come to spend time with you and to say, well, I mean, you take me through all this Christian education, you gave me a good Christian education, you trained us well. <coughs> just so happy, thank you. You know, just you want them, if they come with that attitude, what well, you feel great? But wanting to array the refrigerator, whatever you could be, before they come, they ask, well, how about cooking some collard greens? I like some collars. You know, you know, I like to have some of this or that when I come by. So if you would have that ready. <laughs> <laughs> now that happens all the time. I mean, maybe just in my family. I don't know. <laughs> so when we come to church, it ought not be I'm coming because God expects me to show up on Saturday. I need to be there. I have a position. I got something to do. <clears throat> Come with a heart filled with gratitude. Mm -hmm. So when we sing the hymn, we stand up and we sing like, oh, praise God from whom all blessings flow. You know, we come to praise him. <coughs> See, that's gratitude and not, I gotta go to church this Saturday. This is where I'm supposed to be. No place else to go, and we can't go to the supermarket. <laughs> Yes, and only watch movies today. <laughs> you know, I might as well go to church. And I'm going to the Mariners game. Might as well go to church. So we come because we have gratitude for what God has already done. We're responding to God's love. We're obeying for the right reasons. Now, I'm just going to move around with my notes here for a minute and. and uh, now, let me say this. How many of you believe that whether you obey God or not, He's going to bless you? How many of you believe that? How many of you believe that? Whether you obey God or not, He's going to bless you. Because the rain falls on the righteous and the wicked. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that would be Matthew 5 45. Matthew 5 45. Look at it. We'll look at it real quick. See, whether you obey God or not, He is going to bless you. If He didn't, listen to me now, if God didn't bless sinners, who else would He bless? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, look at it. If He did not bless sinners, who else would He bless? I mean, He woke me up this morning. I'm a sinner. I, I woke up a sinner. He woke me up. That's a blessing. <laughs> He's already blessed me, you see. And so when you look at that passage there in, 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 in Matthew, I think it's Matthew 5, 45, somebody find it. Okay, now that's the passage. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. So whether I obey him or not, I have a job, I have an income, I have heat like you have heat. So now what's the reward for obedience then? Now, see, this is the key. Those are just the common blessings. Now, now I come to Brother Franco and I say, you know, I, I need a couple bucks. He let me have five dollars. He might go in his wallet and give me five dollars. But if Michelle comes and says, Dad, I need a hundred dollars, he just give her the wallet. <laughs> you see the difference? It's in the relationship. You see, there is common blessing, y'all. Just just because I'm a human, I would look at you and give a little bit of pity. I'd give you a dollar. You stand on the street, I'm gonna give you a dollar, you know. Make you think I've done something today. I'm not talking about. <laughs> but now that those are the common blessings that come to everybody, the sun, the rain. God is just good like that. Somebody say amen. amen. God is just good like that. He, he just blesses and he keeps blessing. He, he just keeps blessing. And sometimes we just take it for granted. But when I trust and obey him, as you sang about, 
when I have a vibrant relationship with him, God has obligated himself to care for me. Amen. So when I need something, I can then call on him and know that he will respond to my sensitive pride, my sensitive plea. Amen. So as his child, getting his love because he loves me, then he would pull out his wallet and give it to me. You see, with everything in it. So now I get blessed that the average person doesn't get. Yeah. Now the guy in the club, I'm the, you know, the guy in the club, he doesn't know the blessings of the spirit of prophecy. You all didn't get that. <laughs> I mean, how, how should I say? Uh, uh, the average sinner out there in the world doesn't know the joy of reading Desire of Ages. Now, do you find it a joy? I mean, those of you who read the Desire of Ages? <laughs> yeah. I mean, when you sit down and you read that, and you say, you hear what Sir the Lord says, how John is at the cross and Christ is stuck and looked down at him and he says, Behold thy mother, mother, behold thy son, and he takes her into his home and he's blessed. You read that, you go, you just uh, you read Christ's object lessons and you see those parables and they just come alive to you. I mean, the, the average sinner doesn't see that. Mm -hmm. You see, that's a blessing. Yeah. <laughs> you just, that person don't see it. Yeah, that's because we're not obedient, you see. We're talking about obedience. And out of that obedience, this is what God does for us. He wants us, again, to, to love him and to serve him. And then as we do that, it's his joy and his delight to bless us beyond measure. Yeah. But he does not want us to serve him, to love him, to visit with him, to seek him, only because of the reward. Another side, I don't want to keep us all day, but another area I want to look at with that. Um, this is a powerful point, and I, I'm going to go to my, my notes and look at it here. It's a powerful point that we often miss. Um, let me, I want to get it in the notes. Please listen to this one. Um, it goes something like this. That obedience, obedience promotes worship. First Samuel fifteen twenty two. Find that with me. First Samuel fifteen twenty two. Obedience promotes worship. And someone read it for me. Get you involved. Till you wake up. Don't go to sleep. Thank you. It's First Samuel fifteen twenty two. Um, because this sets the foundation of something else that's very significant. I don't want you to miss this. Okay. Um, let's see. So, when God said to Saul, this is story of Saul, he tells Saul that you ought to, to kill Agag and everything and all the sheep and uh, destroy everything, annihilate it all. And Saul comes back and says, uh, here I have Agag and I have a few of the sheep with me. Uh, has he, I mean he destroyed about everything, has he really obeyed God? <coughs> No. Some of you said he hasn't obeyed. No. <clears throat> um, what about Cain? When Cain comes to the Lord and the Lord expects to, to bring um, an animal, and Cain brings fruit and veggies, and he says, This is what I have, it ought to be acceptable. He <laughs> said, so, This is what I have, it ought to be acceptable. It's all I got. Apparently, he yeah, acted like it was all he had. And I'm sure the Lord would not have required something of him that he didn't have. 
Think about it. But all he brought was the vegetables. Did God accept that offering? No. Why didn't God accept that offering of Cain? So, so it is fair then to say that obedience prompts worship, particularly worship that is accepted. Do you want your worship to be acceptable with God? Yes. See, if you are not obedient in all that God says, let me back up a minute before I finish that whole thing. Let's take another. Uh, there was Naaman. Naaman was told to dump in the old dirty, nasty river of Jordan. I had a person stepping out into the Jordan River once, but he was thinking, all these nice rivers around here, you tell me to go get in the Jordan River? But he was told to go dump into the Jordan River. Did. Seven times. Um, and he didn't think much about that, but he decided he'd do it. He went out there and he dipped, and he dipped once. And he came up and said, this is crazy. He was going to give up. Now, had he done what the Lord had instructed him to do, because he dipped once in the Jordan. <laughs> he stepped into the Jordan, he went out there and he dipped once. Was that sufficient? No. Did he become well? Was he made whole after dumping just once? It was required that he dump seven times. And it was only after the seventh dip that he came up and said, Wow, there he is in God in Israel. <clears throat> it was complete obedience that God was looking for, not partial obedience. Now, folks, many of us who've been around for a while, we have to really look at ourselves because we've gotten in the mode of partial obedience. And just parenthetically, parenthetically, I'll just say this. 5% is not tied. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. 5% is not tied. 9% is not tied. The word tied itself means 10. <laughs> it means 10%. So anything less than that, listen to me carefully, your worship is not acceptable with God. Mm. You don't think you can rob God, have the audacity to rob him, mm -hmm. and then come up in this house. It's like still in my car and then come and visit me. No. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean... <laughs> That's, that's horrid, isn't it? Now, the Bible says rob God. Rob means it's an affrontery. It's not stealing, pickpocket. That's a different thing. Pickpocket, well, not that bad. It's terrible. But when the fellow gets in your face with a gun and says, give it to me. Now, that's a different thing. That's robbery. In all states, to my knowledge, at least in North Carolina, by police, that's called robbery. That's affrontery. In your face. And that's the term the scripture used. When we do not return the tithe, God says we have robbed him. And then you're going to rob God and then have the unmitigated God to walk up in his church and say, bless me. Is that audacity or not? I can tell you that your worship is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. My point I was trying to make here is this. Every worship, offering, or monetary giving that comes outside of obedience, outside of obedience, is rejected by God. And we have the story of Cain and Saul and all the rest of them. When we give God When we give to God, it has to be coupled with obedience. Whatever we give to Him, it has to be coupled with obedience. In other words, it is our obedience that makes our worship acceptable with God. Don't miss that. It is our obedience 
that makes our worship acceptable with God. So, to him that knoweth to do good. <laughs> somebody want to finish that passage for me? And does it not. And does it not. To him, to him or her. It is sin. sin. How can we expect the rewards and the blessings of God if we do not obey Him. Mm. And God wants us to obey Him for the right reasons. <laughs> in your in your uh, in your bulletin, there's a quote from uh, Desire of Ages, I believe it is. Yeah, Desire of Ages, page seven eighteen. And you probably wonder why we put such a uh, a quote like that in here. <laughs> but look at the quote. It's in your bulletin today. It's a short quote. And uh, the bulletin secretary just printed just, just that little bit. And that's good. You see what it says? What does it read? So any Judas is in here this morning? Your spouse sit on the right hand or the left hand like John and James? You expect to get in the promised land? You got some high hopes of, of you know, eternity? Has this been what has caused you to yoke up with the church? To yoke up with Christ? Because you are expecting all the good stuff. Judas Judas, yoked up with Christ, he espoused, he, 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 he got connected with him because of what he desired for himself. That was his foundation. And it was fallacious. It, 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 it was no good. God wants us to serve him for the right reasons. He wants us to serve him out of gratitude. And you know, listen to this. God, God, he, he always sets the example for us. Amen. What do you mean by that, preacher? I mean, God sets the example of gratitude. In other words, if you're obedient, what does God do? I mean, let, let's say you're obedient. So he, he says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the matter of psalm is in these last days. In other words, he's saying, go to church on Sabbath, don't stay home. Hello. <laughs> so don't think you'll stay home next Saturday. Go to church every Saturday. Forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. So when you are obedient and you do that, how does God show gratitude? Put hmm. your thinking caps on. Okay, that's very general. He helps us get here safely. Okay, if we get here at all, it's because. He helped us get here. Mm -hmm. But it's something even better than that. You're on the right track. Put your thinking caps on. He says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. And we're talking about a God of gratitude. So when you do that, how does God show gratitude? Sorry, one more. But I hear He shows up. If you show up, he shows up. As a matter of fact, he shows up before you get here. <laughs> He's anticipating. He knows your moment. So when you get here, he is already here. He has shown his gratitude. Then what else does he do? He sends his spirit and fills the place. He's here. Amen. And he says, well, the angels are all around. Angels, come on. I'm going down to visit the folk in Linwood today. They're going to be faithful. They're going to show up. You cannot show up to God's house and he not show up. Amen. He just responds in gratitude. He appreciates it. When you take one step toward him, he takes two towards you. Yes. That's gratitude. That's how he, he, he's a God. Of, he, that's what he does. He shows it. And he wants us to be the same. When he does something for you, he wants you to show gratitude. And how do we show gratitude? By worshiping him, by obeying him. You see? 
And that obedience comes out of the love. See, not because I need to do it. I want to church today because, well, I, I do get paid, so I might as well go. <laughs> But oftentimes, God has what we call unrequited love. He's waiting to. But that's to be reciprocated. Mm -hmm. For us to love him back. And he needs us. He, he, he commands it. I, to love me. And he says, with all of your heart, all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your being. That's what I demand of you. I, I, I'm not willing to accept halfway trembling worship. Mm -hmm. When you show up just tired, you, just because you got to teach the Sabbath school lesson or because you got to leave the songs today, that's not sufficient for me to show up. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about God. Man. If that's how you come to my house, that's not sufficient for me to show up. But if you're coming to worship me, I'll meet you there. Mm -hmm. See, it's the attitude and you were talking about earlier, that we, we come to him. Is, is, I have something to worship him for. He's been good to me, been with me all week. He's kept me. He's sustained me. I'm alive. I, I need to go and bless the Lord. See, that's why I come, to bless the Lord. Not to get a blessing. To be a blessing, yes. But I come to praise him, to worship him. I'm going to just, I'm going to stop here. Reveled on a little bit. My uh, behavior, purpose, and semantic sentence. My uh, semantic sentence says this, summarizing everything. That obedience, just in case we don't know what obedience is. Obedience is doing what, when, and how he directs. Okay? Are we clear on what obedience is? And, and obedience, I might add one little prayer, one other, one other word. Uh, doing all. See, not part, but all. all obedience is doing what, when, and how, and all that he directs. Not just some of it. You see, we, well, James puts it very clearly. James 1.10. Some of you know that verse. James 1.10, anybody got it by memory? I'll hold for a moment that you find it. But you might have it by memory, James 1.10. Okay. Yeah. Someone, when you find it, read it for me, please. I think it's 1.10. If not, you can correct me. But the rich in his humiliation, because of the flower of the field, he will pass away. That's James 1.10? Yes, sir. That's James 1.10? Okay, 2.10 then, 2.10. 2.10, let's try 2.10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble at one point, okay. he is guilty of all. Okay, thank you. That's what I was looking for, 2.10. 2.10. <laughs> we, we as Adventists, we're quick to let people know that. And we're quick to tell them that uh, if you keep the traditions of men just worshiping on Sunday, <laughs> you're going to keep all nine but breaking one, you tell folks quickly that you're guilty of all. You might as well not do any of it. You haven't done any of it. You break one, you're guilty of all. And so what God's expecting is complete and whole worship. And to worship him for the right reasons. And that is out of love and gratitude. So I conclude with my sermonic, with my behavior purpose. That you and I, by God's grace, we develop a lifestyle of obedience simply because we love God. Simply because we love God. As I conclude now, why do we want to love Him? Because of all that He's done this weekend around the world. Yeah, around the world because uh, uh, all over the world, we, we, we think now of Good Friday and uh, 
Resurrection Sunday and Sabbath with Christ laid in the tomb. But all of that that preceded that was Christ giving up everything. Leaving glory. Coming to earth. To be treated the way you and I deserve to be treated. Spat upon, beat, whipped, mistreated constantly. And then to be crucified an ignominious death on Calvary's cross for you and for me. Looking at that and knowing that you and I deserve that and still know the kind of life that you and I lead and that he is still willing to forgive us, mm -hmm. to overlook our faults. He says if we confess, he will cleanse us from all sin and unrighteousness. Cleanse us, forgive and cleanse and make it as though we have never sinned. And in him, in him, in his death, in him, we become the righteous. I want you to get this. And I'm, 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 I'm quitting, but I want you to get this. He, the pure holy one, became sin. He became sin for us in order that we might become the righteous. Mm -hmm. the holy, the pure. You and I, that's what we become in him. That's what he has done. He has left nothing. There, there is no reason that any should ever be lost. And with all that he's done for us, our response ought to be more love to be. More love to be. Lord, give me greater love, greater grace to love you more. Complete and total surrender. God, help me to give everything I have because you have given all you have. To him right a pen those beautiful words, I hear that voice, the Savior's voice calling. I think it's him with the two, what's the hymn they're singing? I'm going to invite you to turn that scene. 282. I hear thy welcome voice that calls me Lord to thee for cleansing in thy precious blood that flows on Calvary. Though coming weak and vile, thou dost my strength assure. For thou my vow is fullest cleanse. Tis spotless, all and pure. I come, Lord, come now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in that blood that flows on Calvary. Of course, do we know, do we know this hymn? No, you I'm sorry. No, no, it's yeah. fine. Uh, it's an excellent hymn. Look at the last words there. All hell, atoning blood. All hell redeeming grace. All hell the gift of Christ our Lord, our strength, and our righteousness. Amen. I am coming, Lord. That's all he wants us to do. Come, just as we are. I am coming, Lord. Coming now to thee. Wash me, cleanse me in the blood that flowed on Calvary. Let this be your response in total obedience. If you'll please stand as we sing together today, number 282, I hear thy welcome voice, number 282. <laughs> Amen. 